Hi, I'm Hillel Neuer with UN Watch, and we're joined with Marina Nemat, an Iranian dissident author, human rights activist, someone who was a victim of the Iranian regime a number of years ago. Uh, Marina, you've uh, just come out recently from session of Iran being reviewed on its human rights record in this chamber. Uh, what struck you? Uh, what, did anything happen that was unexpected? What, what, what are your impressions coming out of this experience? I don't think really anything was unexpected per se, but uh, I think what always strikes me when I listen to Iranian officials uh, speak abroad is that uh, they lie in the most outrageous way that is almost unimaginable. So for, for an Iranian official to, to have the, um, I don't even know what to call it, the ability, I guess, to, yes, like it is something really dark and evil, basically. It is not a something that, I'm sorry to say, that a decent human being can do. To be able to go up in front of the world and to know that, uh, you know, there are families of victims, that there are the victims, some of them who survived, actually happened to survive, who are sitting out there and who would be hearing this to say, we did, do, do not even have to live in prison. That the people who are in prison, uh, they have threatened our national security. Really? I mean, when I was in prison, 90% of us in the 80s, we were under the age of 20. How can 15-year-olds and by like thousands and thousands who wanted education, who wanted to be allowed to wear whatever they wanted to wear, I mean, I did not want to wear the hijab. Kids, who, boys and girls wanted to go out together. Boys and girls wanted to go and dance and have a beer and have fun. How? Could they possibly threaten anyone's natural, national security is beyond. We are not talking about militants. We are not talking about terrorists. We are talking about teenagers. This was uh, beyond me. How could you possibly go up in front of a natural, you know, international crowd and claim that Iran doesn't have any political prisoners or that they never tortured anybody? Because I'm standing here. So when Mr. Larry Johnny goes up in front of the international community and says, we never tortured anybody, it's basically like saying I don't exist. That my whole existence and the existence of all of my friends who are buried in mass graves in Iran, and those who survived, and there are many of us out there, we don't even exist. So that was extremely disturbing. One of the members of the delegation you mentioned, Mohammed Larijani, is the head of the Human Rights Department in Iran. Uh, there were a number of people in the delegation. One of them was a woman. Uh, she was all covered, but it was a woman. Um, and I, I, she was talking about women's rights. Um, does does Iran have a strong record on protecting women's rights? Was she saying the same things that were accurate? Honestly, at that point, I started laughing out loud, and people started looking at her. Because what she was saying was almost like a joke. So let's be very clear. I think what the Iranian delegation failed to do was to be very clear on what Iranian law, I mean what is written in the books, actually dictates. According to Iranian law, which is based on Sharia law, officially the testimony of a woman is worth half of a man. In my books, when my testimony is worth half of the testimony of a man, this is not justice, this is not freedom, and this is not equality. Because half doesn't equal one. Half is half of one. So basically, according to Iranian law, a woman is worth half of a man. And I think that's just enough, enough said on this topic. So she can say whatever she wants, but she cannot, de she cannot deny what is actually written in the Iranian books. Now, uh you were there for three hours, Iran presented its report, and then all the countries that wanted to, maybe 100 or so countries, took the floor and were able to ask questions and make statements very briefly about Iran's record. I want to talk first about the countries that, that praised Iran. Uh, there were a lot of them. There was uh, Bangladesh, Yemen, um, Syria, uh, many countries praised Iran. Um, North Korea. North Korea. <laughs> Uh, and, and maybe others that aren't as, as dictatorial, Sri Lanka and others. Um, what was your sense of hearing those words of praise and commending the effort to implement and make progress 
and recommend that they continue doing the right thing. What was, what was your, what were your feelings on hearing those kinds of statements? I would really love, like, I, I consider this an invitation. So I invite every single one of those individuals who sat down there in their comfortable chairs and uh, had this conversation with Iran to come and sit with me at the same table. Look at me straight in the eye and tell me that Iran has a great uh, human rights record. I would love it if they can actually look at me in the eye and they can say that. And I have a feeling that they are not going to be as courageous if they are actually faced with the victims. I'm not just me. If we can actually gather these victims and if instead of you know, addressing the assembly at the UN, if they could come and look at us in the face and say it's us. Yes. There were a number of countries, a uh, minority, but uh, a number of countries that took the floor and mentioned real problems in Iran. Any, any countries in particular stand out that you heard them and you said, wow, that country is standing up uh, and, say, and saying true things and, and is using their time at the UN for what the UN was meant to be for. You know what, there are actually a few of them. I think, you know, again, my memory was three hours, so there was a lot of coming, but there was the UK. I think the UK was the first one that it was very precise, mm. you know, to address the main problems, you know, and, and one of them was the mass executions. I mean, uh, Iran has the highest number of executions in Canada, and they addressed that, and the fact that juvenile offenders would be executed because of their crimes, and the fact that there is no religious freedom in Iran, and that there are members of the Baha'i community, of the Dervish community, of the Christian community in Iran. So there were uh, the, the issue of women's rights. There were the UK, was definitely great in Norway, made a very good statement. Sweden was great. Um, Canada was very Canadian. well. Yes, I, I'm very proud of the Canadian government for standing up to that. Germany made some good statements. Uh, Denmark was really good. So I mean, there were definitely countries of the United States. They, you know, they spoke well. So I mean, in the grand scheme of things, um, I think as a as a survivor of this um, barbaric system that kills, tortures, and lies. Thank you. Because in this case, I think really, I always say that silence is all in one's instruction. Anything else uh, about that you, you want to share with us about your experience as someone who went through Evan Prison and, and all the uh, horrific experiences that you had? Uh, sitting here for a three hour discussion on Iran's human rights record, where most of the time uh, a presentation was given to Iran, uh, speaking about all the wonderful things they're doing. Uh, anything you want to add about your experience that you, that you had to in that window here? It was, there were moments there that I felt nausea like rising, and uh, there were moments that I just wanted to go out, but I didn't have that much. Because in my life belongs to those that the Islamic Republic of Iran has murdered and has wronged and continues to do so. At least like, if it had ended, I could go home and be normal, get a dog, and live happy ever after. But it's not a possibility because it is ongoing. So that is a huge, huge problem. The fact that there are still people being imprisoned and murdered in Iran, uh, it, 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 it's big. So I think as somebody who has survived the system, it is very important for us that good people in the world stand with us. Now, I understand what the UN is, don't get me wrong. UN is a place where uh, the, good and, the good and the bad, the, the beautiful and the ugly, uh, they all are supposed to come together. I definitely believe that my enemies have the right to speak. And again, I understand what diplomacy means. I mean, here again, you have everybody coming in, whether we agree with them or disagree with them, whether they're good or they're bad, they have the right to take the stage and to speak. And I can actually entirely understand and respect that. But at the same time, I think that when we are giving them this opportunity, I mean, Malala, who uh, very rightfully uh, just got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, she took the stage and the UN and she spoke. And I think it is very important for women, I mean, even if it's like one day, actually not only for one minute and 20 seconds, but for, you know, we, we heard, you know, just talk and talk and talk to So I mean, to invite a few of these uh, victims and to allow them to take this 
stage and stand in front of representatives of government and, and to bear witness to what they have actually felt and, and experienced. I, I think that's extremely important. I mean, those who shot my law and uh, the Taliban would we allow them to come here today and, and stand and tell the world that Malala is not worth it, that Malala, for example, deserves to die. I mean, that's what they believe because that's what they show for, right? But we allow, what's the difference here? I mean, for me, for what I'm standing, the difference between the Taliban and the government of Iran is that the Taliban are not the government at the moment. But Iran is a government. They're, they're, both, is, they're, they're both outlaws. Yes, they're, they're both yes, anti women they're, they're both anti human rights extremists. They do not have any respect. Like, the Iranian uh, references said that uh, uh, there's freedom of religion in Iran. I'm so sorry, but I'm Christian. And uh, I was born in a Christian family. There is no freedom of religion in Iran. If, especially if a Muslim converts to another religion, according to Iranian mm -hmm. law, he or she could be killed. And the Taliban believes in the same thing, IS believes in the same thing. So the foundation, I think this is so important to understand, that the foundation of the ideology, I'm not talking religion here, but the ideology of what IS believes in, what Iran believes in, the government of Iran, not the people, the government of Iran believes in, and the Taliban believes in, they're all the same thing. But the government of Iran takes the stage, says whatever it wants to the world, and yet, we don't give the stage to the one. And this is just a technicality. I just want the world. I understand the technicality. I respect it. But at the same time, the fact that it's there and I swallow that, and many others like me, I'm just asking the United Nations and the international community, every once in a while, I mean, for the heck of it, to give us that microphone and let us just not be with disrespect to the but just to be able to Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me.